Hey there, and welcome to Table to Stage. I'm Jordan Worma, and this is my podcast, my continuing mission to explore creativity through these stories and the experiences of creators throughout my home state of Connecticut and the wider world. Today's creator is Richard DiCarlo. He's a visual artist working in multimedia, three-dimensional sculpture, and other forms. Um, you really have to see his work to understand it, so visit the Studio of Richard DiCarlo on Facebook to get that visual reference. Now, if you're enjoying the show, I hope you'll take a few minutes to leave a rating and a review of the pod on Apple Podcasts or Stitcher or wherever you listen. Ratings and reviews are the best way to help spread the word and to find new people who might be interested in hearing about the incredible creators featured on the show. If you have a comment or a question for me, you can send those to table to stage at gmail.com or send a message on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. I really do love to hear from listeners, so if you have a comment, send it along. Okay, let's get to Richard DiCarlo from Main Street Gallery in Ansonia, Connecticut. Where are you from originally? Are you a Connecticut native? No, I'm an, actually a New Yorker, transplanted New Yorker. Oh, all right. Uh, grew up in the Bronx, New York, and uh, moved to Bronxville, New York, in Westchester County. Okay. Uh, but I basically worked out of Manhattan for many years. Okay. What kind of work did you do in Manhattan? Uh, well, actually, I had, you know, the artwork. I was, oh, uh, all right. I was a designer. I worked. I had a, um, I was a freelance illustrator and designer, and I worked out of um, down Lower Manhattan uh, as part of the Graphic Artists Guild in New York City, which is a um, it's a organization, um, basically like a artist union yeah. uh, that represents artists and um, designers on ethical and um, legal issues. Okay, and stuff. So it just it branched off of that. Yeah, and I was big into the um, into the publishing industry. I worked with oh. many many major publishers. I was a uh, so called ghost illustrator. Ah, uh-huh, okay. <laughs> they would make me go after hours down to Manhattan. I'd go after hours. They would, you don't exist. Don't ever mention this to anybody. <laughs> and I would alter the copyrighted illustrations to all the artists that uh, failed to fulfill their um, obligations to the publisher and stuff. Oh. So I was um, able to match styles. Okay. So I was, so I was a kind of a chameleon. I was, That's got to be a skill uh, set yeah. of itself, isn't it? I can replicate all the. Yeah. I can replicate all their styles and finish up the artwork. So I'd sit there and they, you know, you go there like five, six o'clock at night after everybody goes home. I'm down there, and you're knocking on the door of a brownstone. They take a little single elevator into the basement, and all the editors are down there, <laughs> and it's just like something out of the movies. Yeah. And they just present you with piles of. Well, back then it was piles of paper. Everything now, what put me out of business was Photoshop. <laughs> And everything was done with uh, patches and uh, mailing labels and glue, uh, rubber cement. Oh, really? And, yeah, we'd go there and you'd see pictures. Um, okay, we have a pile of pictures. There's 90 pictures, 100 pictures here. And we got to alter them. And so what, what, you, you know, what you do is, you know, and they would have little directions on there, number item 52-3, you know, whatever the number corresponds to. Um, and they go, make the Chinese person look less Chinese. <laughs> <laughs> and you say, okay, how is this going to be done? Yeah. And, and just if you had to make an African-American person look less African-American. And what they ended up saying is they want these, like, nationality androgynous, I don't know, they, you know, these alien people that look like everything. <laughs> okay. And that's what they want. They want the everything people. Just the general hint of a human of some of kind. Human, but they had to look, they didn't, can't look white bread. You know, they had to look kind of ethnic. So they right. were kind of a mixy looking. They all look Spanish. Oh, okay. So everybody looks Spanish in the thing. Yeah. That's what they did. So you weren't allowed to draw nappy hair for an African American. Oh, you can't do that. Well, how are you going to tell, um, you know, um, Leroy or whatever from, you know, from Larry. Yeah. You know, you know, a description of Leroy would be, you know, an ethnic, uh, an African-American ethnic, ethnicity. And what other way are you going to do it? You yeah. have in black and white. You're talking a line art. So you have to do it by the hair and stuff like that. And that's what you had to go by. The one thing they frowned on was the, the Oriental people having the straight haircuts, the bowl haircuts. Oh, yeah. You know, I, I can see this stuff being... You know, them being sensitive to this that. This is the 80s? This is the 80s and 90s, yeah, yeah. okay. But it was fun, and I had a I had a good run, and it was like brain surgery money, and you just, uh, it was just funny. You're sitting there just at the dinner table, and like, hey, here we go, and 
I didn't waste my time to, in the studio. I just yeah. do it anywhere I was. I'd be bring the stuff with me. It's in my car all the time. I had a portable studio, and I'm just, what are you doing? And I'm doing work. How did how did you fall into something like that? I mean, what, what was your background that that got you into, you know, replicating other people's work and, and making those changes? I don't know what the actual transition was. I always made art when I was a kid. I wasn't. Yeah. I was never formally trained. I just saw things and I wanted to emulate them. I wanted to, you know, I was like, wow, I want to draw that, you know. Yeah. Like when I was six year old, six years old, I did a my I did a still life, but we didn't know what to buy. My my parents had no idea what to buy. I had all this great linoleum they painted on linoleum scraps of wood and stuff like that and um my mother didn't know what kind of paints to get so i did them i was painting watercolors using the watercolor paints the wrong way wow you know i was painting them just straight from the cake you're supposed to use them in the mix them in the tray and yeah, stuff yeah. like that but i didn't know i just wanted to make art so yeah. i knew and i still have the painting this day um i did a still life of a pineapple oranges and a banana and a white bowl yeah. on a table with a blue background and the thing is like it's like fifty something years old, so. <laughs> but I still have it, and it's you know the the years. It's on a piece of linoleum. It's on a piece of linoleum, yeah. Wow. So I'm sorry, not linoleum, uh, masonite. Oh, masonite, okay. Yeah, it has the laminate one side. I paint on the smooth side. Yeah. So it's, yeah. <laughs> and find a canvas wherever you could get one. Exactly. So I was. That's what introduced me to did it looking outside the box when it came to canvas because we didn't have canvas back yeah. then. Had paper, and when the paper ran out, my mom used to tear open the brown paper bags. And go have at it. You know, mm-hmm. these the um, there was a certain way to open the bags up so it would fill up the entire coffee table in my parents' living room. And I'd sit there with pens and draw for hours. Yeah. And she would say, my mother always would say, she goes, "You kind of something wrong with you, you know?" Because I, I always draw, <laughs> I would draw landscapes. Let's say a cityscape. Yeah. I draw the airplanes in the sky. I draw the elevated trains, which is was synonymous with the Bronx and right. Third Avenue L back then, and um, the cars in the streets. And then I would draw basements, you know, like a cross section. Then I draw the subway, the pipes, and, and everything going on. Oh, okay. And it's just like I was just always looked at it a different way. I go, I'm yeah. not just going to do a street. Let's do everything, I, you know, like X-ray vision kind of thing. Yeah. And it, I guess it's a different way to look at things. Yeah, I would look at the. I was more interested in the structure of things, so to speak, or what made it work. Sure. You know, things behind that. Do you know what it was that sparked your interest in creating those? those paintings those drawings on your own were you surrounded by people who were into the arts when you were younger or is it something you came to on your own my mother was a designer fashion designer so the creativity was in there my father liked uh, was an engineer so oh uh, basically he um did well, i could um, come where the basements and the sewers and stuff so he did into. schematics of airplanes <laughs> so not even the streets but yeah. the schematics but i think my father would make you look at um Look at things in a different way. He'd take you out. He'd take us on trips and stuff. Here, come here. Look at this. And yeah. you sit there. What am I looking at this for? What am I looking at that for? He'd go, here, come here. Look at it. I want to show you something. So he'd show you something obscure. And he was the one that really kind of um, introduced me to looking at things, um, you know, exa- You know, let's say stopping and smelling the roses, I would say, it, but on a visual on a visual, um, a visual, visual angle, so to right. speak. And um and that's what, you know, I started looking at things from another perspective. So that's, I think, where it came from. Yeah. You know, so a little science, a little bit of intrigue, a little bit of everything behind it, and it worked. You know, yeah. it just, it stuck with me. So you, you sort of took that, to the, the, the creative eye of being able to kind of peel back the layers on stuff of an engineer. Exactly. The design elements from, from your mother's side. And started creating your own pieces of art out of that, huh? Exactly. I mean, I tried, I delved in everything I've done, patent design to um, cartooning and yeah. stuff, which is really, uh, the one thing I found out is I don't have the, um, I did patent design for a couple of weeks. I didn't last that long. So I was, um, I went down to Manhattan, again, working in Manhattan. I worked for this fella and um, um, it just, I could not do it. I would just find myself making mistakes. I can't stand rapidograph pens back in the day. Uh-huh. Um, there were, I just didn't have the, um, the discipline to use the the pen the certain way and you know like i was doing carvel cakes back in the or tom carvel cakes and yeah i had to do the, the fudgy lines the whale with, fudgy the whale it's all this it's the same cake it's the same shape the yeah. same mold but a different um the patent design of each figure was um pretty interesting how intricate it is so you have to do a certain um you got to do a thickness of line for the um 
let's say the frosting mm-hmm. is the frosting line is much different than the uh, different thickness than the plate that the cake is resting on, so to speak. Okay. And um, I would I don't have the discipline. I just do whatever I like. He goes, you can't do that. <laughs> what? It looks like the cake. Yeah, but that's you. The way you drew it, it looks like it's made of steel. <laughs> I'm sure they'll know it says ice cream cake. And you know, yeah, right. But it was, that's what the lines defined the surface. And I just didn't. I didn't have the discipline for. I go. You know what? I can't deal with this. So yeah. I had a. I had to leave. Publishing. Uh, I'm sorry. That's no. That's funny. Like, cause he's, your father, you said, was an engineer. He worked in blueprints a lot. He did a lot of cross section drawing when you were a kid. And then the patent stuff. It's all, all that stuff that you're just talking about is very angular. Requires rulers and very sharp lines exactly. and specific measurements. But the art, like the style that you work in now, is much more fluid. There's more sort of round shapes and so was it was that like a conscious thing for you or were you just more drawn to i'm that aesthetic yeah i was more drawn to that yes the aesthetic of it all it's just the this the roundness is more is more pleasing to me yeah like i can design i could i have no qualms designing something like i did i could do city seals i the most recent thing i did was city of ansonia redesigned their seal like can you do this you can really nobody can do this i could do that (laughs) You know, and it's very intricate. Now I have the computer program. You know, the, mm-hmm. I have this. I use this basically is a lot of my stuff. Computerized stuff is uh, I use this um, program called Corel, mm-hmm. and it's more of a sign a sign industry mm-hmm. um, thing. That's and been could, around for a long time. Yeah, I could use. Uh, yeah, I've been you know, I've been a uh, Corel fan since Corel three. You know, so mm-hmm. <laughs> that's the early stage. Now they're at thirty or something like that. And I still have the older versions. Um, that was like, the old, the old early '90s uh, yeah. PCs that had exactly, the Corel yeah. stuff on them. So, I mean, your your art now, how how would you describe the stuff that you work in now? Like, what what are the mediums that you generally will use? Well, I refer to my stuff as fiascos. <laughs> it's, a, um, it's just it's whatever you throw in the works. Uh-huh. It's it's like it's like having an over the top um, ice cream sundae or something. You throw everything in there. Hey, you ever have uh, walnuts in there? Sure, <laughs> throw them in there. How about whipped cream? Sure, go for it. You, yeah, know, you yeah. keep on throwing it in there, and then you, before you know it, you had uh, a monstrosity. But <laughs> it's good. You know, they, it came out good. I mean, there's a point where you just throw everything in there and it turns to mud. Yeah. But you know it ahead of time, so that'll sit on the shelf and never get complete. Um, I just have to. Yeah, I just, it's whatever is pleasing to me. It comes up, it starts with an idea, mm-hmm. and then I go, how can I uh, make somebody react to it? That's that's one of my first thinkings with, you know, with somebody. I'll see something, and somebody will be going, oh, look, it's a uh, nice picture of flowers. Yeah, but, all right, it's a nice picture, a beautiful picture of flowers and stuff. Can I do flowers? Yeah, probably, but it, will I enjoy doing it? No, I won't enjoy it. But if I can make those flowers do something, wow, how about if it reaches out and tries ripping your face off? <laughs> you know, wow, that would be a good flower. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know, that kind of stuff. So you, you just, you know, what would make somebody react? So I learned how to uh, break the bounds, the the uh, the third wall, so to speak, of mm-hmm. the picture. And um, a couple artists do it, but I just like bringing stuff out. You know, you just bring it outside the frame because – I'm not, I don't like being held to, um, I don't like, I, I'm not the kind of person that sits here and draws in the lines in mm-hmm. the coloring book. You know, make your own picture. You know, they had something I read, you know, in the coloring books, I would just change the coloring books around because they were boring. Mm-hmm. So I take a, like a black, I'd alter the image with black and white uh, with a uh, pen and ink before I would draw anything. This is what I was doing when I was a kid. Um, let's say I had a picture of a duck. You know, this duck is pretty boring. So what can we do to this duck? Oh, let's put a hat on him. So I draw the outline of the hat and give him sunglasses and, you know, roller skates, whatever. And then I would color him in after that. So yeah. I'd alter the actual image and then color it in like a normal kid. But I'd have to change it first <laughs> and then make people look at that. Yeah. What the heck is going on there? As far as, like, the, the stuff the, – the, let me back up. So you you work a lot in three-dimensional – sculpture paintings now yes. right that, that's fair to, way to describe it I exactly think. yeah when you're talking about like just a coloring book you're taking a two-dimensional image you're just painting it and the images that you're creating now look like something you would find in a painting but they're spilling out of yes. the frame right 
How do you go about determining when you're putting something like that together, which elements in that frame are going to spill out toward your your viewer and which ones are going to be you know, left in the background and, and not featured? Well, I'm a fan of perspective. I was a... <laughs> I was a I was also an animator and uh, and a filmmaker. Oh, I went to wow, I okay. went to film school, and um, when film school didn't didn't lend out uh, didn't lead to anything, you know. Oh, we got jobs through after that. You come out in the market. It was in between the computer stuff and the old school stuff. So mm-hmm. I came out. I went to film school at the wrong time. They don't tell you there's no <laughs> jobs, and if you didn't learn the computer, you were dead in the water. Right. So I was dead in the water, uh, creatively speaking, and and financially. That's what they do to you. So I went to illustration. Mm-hmm. Um, so I still had that film, the cinematic um, look. So I know I know that um, the screen was you're dealing with a three dimensional um, elements in the screen. So mm-hmm. I used to like the old Max Fleischer um, cartoons back in the the early days. With the um, they had um, like they had the multi planes where you traveled into the picture. Like if you had to go into the jungle, the, mm-hmm. you know you saw. Like the early Snow Whites and stuff, mm-hmm. you know, the camera went into the picture. Right. And you were traveling in. So I was always intrigued by that. That's what got me in love with the animation was you can move in and out. So I figured, okay, I'm doing drawings and doing art and work now. And I go, might as well move it out. Let me see if I could do multi-plane. So I experimented and I go, I couldn't, um, I tried doing um, like animation pictures like I was drawing on acetate. Mm-hmm. You know, painting on acetate, making like animation cells. And you have layers, but it just didn't right. do anything. And I go, what way can I make it have some punch? I go, oh, I know. I can actually do things coming out of the frame, jumping out. And so I learned to you do the layers with the animation cells or mm-hmm. glass. And then I added, I found out, um, I was trying different items to use. And I found out that terracotta clay yeah. worked out great. And, and foam and, you know, anything you can do, anything you can muster up. And aluminum foil is your friend, too. Sure. Yeah. And, and plaster. But so these elements... Um, I can use these elements to come out of the frame. So, like, if I was going to do baseball, um, I just don't want to do an aesthetic, you know, boring, aesthetically boring piece. So, what's happening in this piece? Well, what's happening? The the image has to tell a story. Mm -hmm. So, I just don't want to do, let's say, a baseball player standing there. What's the story? Why am I looking at this baseball player? Why am I going to buy this? You know, why would somebody want to buy this? You know? And then I go, okay, what is this guy doing? Oh, he's in the on-deck circle. Like, I have a, a painting that's called um, We Were Legends. Mm-hmm. You've probably seen that online, which I is did, the baseball yeah. with them. Mm-hmm. Um, and I go, all right, We Were Legends. And I can just picture a little kid sitting there as Bat Boy with Lou Gehrig, Babe Ruth, and um, all those other fellas in, on the bench and, you know, and him telling his grandkids the story about how he used to play baseball with them. And, it, <laughs> and all he was just the Bat Boy or something yeah, like yeah. that. So the image is the little boy sitting in the front, and he's not even paying attention to... Um, Lou Gehrig, because you know Lou Gehrig's in the uh, secondary character, and he's like warming up and trying a bat out, mm-hmm. and the kid's blowing a bubble, and I go, well, let's make what can I do to make this interesting? So I go, oh, Lou Gehrig's bat, so I made his bat come out of the mm-hmm. picture. Toughest part of that was getting the proper angle. So I let that bat. I my I used my son's t-ball bat, a little tiny bat, and I was going to throw it out. <laughs> and what am I saving this thing for? And I go, you know, the bat was broken. I go, you know, I can probably, you know, let me make something out of this. So I, I figured out the proper angle where you can see it at least from three or four different angles and it looked like it oh. still worked. Okay. And that piece, it actually, if you look at it every way except straight down, it works. So it kind of moved. And it, if you walk around, it almost looks like the bat is being swung. Yeah. You know, if you walk around. Same through the eyes. Sometimes I'll put fake eyes in them and the eyes will follow you too. So it's just oh, the little okay. three-dimensional three elements you find out that will follow you around or just from each angle it does look properly. So there's kind of a um, little bit of um, optical illusion involved. So, mm-hmm. so there's some little bit of math involved and stuff like that. So, And it's not that I want to do math, but it just com- <laughs> it comes into play. So there's trigonometric well, functions that, that, involved. That patent illustration stuff must come in handy. <laughs> oh, it just... It does and it doesn't. It's just you know that that was that was haunting. I, I that would make me stop making art. Oh, okay. You know, if you know until you see the paychecks you make. <laughs> I just couldn't do that. I could not do that in day in day out. You just can't see that happening. Yeah. 
Um, but, you know, to make the elements come out. And then once you get first element, you go, okay, what else can pop out? So I made the brim of the hat come out. And I took my son's, another, his baseball cap, and I cut the brim off. So the brim comes out. Oh, I see. Um, then I figured, oh, he can be blowing a bubble. So and I bubble. And I looked around. I was going to, looking for that um, super elastic bubble plastic. They have that mm-hmm. stuff used to make in the tube. But it didn't stay solid enough. I tried a glass ball. didn't work. Then I found, um, I went to the... Like a, I was in a five and dime store. They still have those. <laughs> um, an old one of those, like old stores with everything in it. Yeah. You know, a dollar store we have. Right. And I found the rubber balls, the Spaldines, mm-hmm. and I found one of those. I go, oh wow! All I do is I sanded off the um, the little seam on the ball, and it was like, this is great. It looks just like bubble gum, and somebody can poke at it, and they won't damage it. It right. won't fall off. So I was able to glue that down. I painted it the bubble gum color. And it looks like a bubble, you know, yeah. as close to the bubble as I can get. And it's a funny piece. It's a, just a fun piece. It is, it is a fun one. It just stops traffic. You know. I, I imagine seeing it in person has to be a very different impact than seeing just the image on, online. Yeah, it's, it's, quite a, it's, quite an under, you know, it's quite a different thing in person. Yeah. You know, photos don't do any of the images. It don't, just doesn't do them justice. You've got to sit there. And what I get a kick out is the people's faces when they see the pieces. It's like, oh my god, <laughs> you know. It's like they're in, they're just all struck. Yeah. You know. Um, so, it's it's just um, you know I just I call it the, the I call it the stuff of legends. You know, you'll hear people talk about it and they'll embellish it a little bit and it just it'd be so different that they embellish the piece and it looks like you're doing, you know. Right. Is that they're describing my piece or something? It's like <laughs> I thought they were describing something they saw in the Louvre or something. You know, uh, they just described a little thing that was sitting in the corner on the floor I had, you know. Yeah, where where do you find your inspiration for the pieces that you're doing? Is it just kind of random or do you have themes you like to work with? It is random. I'm falling into things like um, I like experiments with different art forms. Like I will try. I do frescoes. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, you know, not, a lot, not a lot of people do frescoes. I do cave Cave paintings. I got two in the gallery over here behind you. Actual faux cave paintings. So I like all kinds of all kinds of art. I'm not afraid to try it. So if I see something, I'll try it. The only thing I won't try is I don't like is oil paints. Really? I because I'm the idiot who they don't dry in time, and I'm the idiot who goes oh, to okay. sign my name and I'll put my arm across the painting <laughs> and ruin a great painting, and I go ah. And once you mess up on it, you can never get it back, right. no matter what. You can scrape the whole area, but it looks like you, you know what's missing, and mm-hmm. I. I just have, I don't have the, again, it comes to discipline. You know, I do not have the discipline to handle it. You know, um, I make up my own rules with watercolors. I just recently found out after 35 years that the watercolors, you, even with the cheap sets, anything, you, you don't take the cake, uh, watercolors directly out of the cakes. Right. You take it, you dip the brush in the water, you go to the cake, and then you mix it on the tray. And that was a, uh, that was like a eureka moment for me, and I just <laughs> I tell I teach I teach watercoloring. That's a very popular. I, oh I yeah, do a, I took I do a like watercolor a, class once. So yeah, I, can, I do I, a, can I do paint and sips at watercolors, okay. and I call it the great equalizer. We use we use the dollar store paints and stuff mm-hmm. like that, and all like the paintings. Uh, and over mm-hmm. here, I all these are done with the dollar paints. You know, it's like oh, you can't paint with those, and I tell the artists that come in with their one hundred fifty dollar paint sets and Winsor Newton stuff, and I go no 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 put that away. I go, you're using this. He goes, I'm not using that baby stuff. I go, well, look, all these paintings are drawn with, were painted with these yeah. dollar paints. The only thing different is the pigment will disappear in the sun. So, yeah, if you got you got to put a fixative on it. Yeah. You know, um, it doesn't have the light fastness of a um, higher quality paint. But nonetheless, you get the image done, and it's uh, I teach a quick way for people to make something out of it. Yeah. But the inspiration in, is basically comes just from ideas. You sit there and you're looking at things, and you, um, like I'm a I'm a very visual person, so to speak, and I have let's say um, they would refer to me like a projectionist, where the images are in my head mm-hmm. and they pop up like a movie in front of you, 24 hours a day. It's constant, you know. A lot of people would think it's sickness or something. <laughs> but, I mean, even as we speak, I can see my next paintings and stuff flashing. Oh, and It's like, okay. it's annoying. But if <laughs> you learn to just ignore it. Um, the best way I can describe it for those who don't know what I'm talking about is if you look at a light bulb and close your eyes and you see, like, the blue image, the sure, negative, yeah. it's like that. But really? It's like, yeah. And it's not as clear as you think. It can be really vivid sometimes, but if I'm doing nothing. But when I'm talking, it looks like 
like, like, a, like the negative of something. Yeah, it's like kind of negative. Yeah, it's of, like of negatives, something. or just it appears as lines, or just as a weak. Looks like a projection of a weak of a weak thing. But huh. the, I retain that, and it's in my head, and I can punch it up anytime. Once it's in my head, I can I record it like in my in my brain. Right. So now it's in my head, and I'll work the picture. What I'll do is I'll be driving in a long time, and I'm driving in the, in the car. My wife sees me like swatting flies out of the way and talking to myself. No, that's not it. She goes, what the hell are you doing? And I go, oh, I'm sorry. I'm working on a picture. You're driving the car. Yeah, but the pictures are coming up right. and I got to fix them. Wow. You you, know, so you, are you editing the picture as I'm you're, editing as, as, you're I'm, as, I'm, it? as I'm going on. I can wow. fix it. And it's just like, no, that's not it. No, no. So when I go down to do the piece, I don't have any sketches. I rarely, seldom do I have a sketch or anything. It's there. It's in my head. It's, it's getting yeah. made. So I do um, paintings in the street, and they go, what are you using as reference? I go, it's in my head. I don't know exactly what I'm doing. I'll, a couple of mermaid pieces I did from down in Milford at the um, festivals and stuff. And I just, uh, out of my head, no reference and stuff like that. And, wow. Um, I mean, sometimes it's hit or miss because I won't, uh, if I'm overthinking a certain, a certain pose I saw somewhere and I want to apply it to the mermaid, and... I may make, I may miss it. And mm-hmm. you'll see in the painting, it'll be like, something's missing. And I'll have to go back and correct it. But I'll need somebody to point it out. Right. But I know it's something wrong with it, but I don't know what it is. So I'll either step away for a while, leave it, and, or I'll have somebody, what, what do you see wrong? Oh, our elbow's wrong. Ah, that's it. Okay. Yeah. But it just usually comes down to shadows and highlights because that all depends on, um, your persp- throws a perspective off. Sure. If you shadow in the wrong spot, you ruin the whole painting. So. Now, do you do you work with like a body reference for um, anatomy, or is it really just a matter of what you see in your head? Is what's uh, it's coming basically out? what's in my head, and okay. the, and they all look like if I if you've seen all of my drawings, I have this, I guess, a muse. I have my this look that's that everybody looks related all my pieces look related yeah um my mermaids my um the funny thing is my mermaids and my angels and all my things my wife looks like could be their sister kind of so my wife actually looks like that too and this is before i met my wife i was you know it's kind of weird huh so it's like i i didn't it's just people start pointing it out and i go oh you're painting your wife you're painting your wife you go (laughs) <laughs> Actually, I never realized I was doing that. You know, the hair color, the the face and stuff. Yeah. So it's like a, a straw. All my drawings are strawberry blondes, huh? And stuff. I didn't realize I was doing that. I, you know, and redheads. You know, so I didn't never realize that until somebody pointed it out. You know, you don't you don't think the usage your paint um, right. your paint palette your color palette so to speak it stays the same. A lot of my stuff has a lot of teal in it. A lot of. Um, Teal and uh, different kind that is a cerulean blue, a special mm-hmm. blue. And you can point my stuff out a mile away. Wow, how would you get that? So when I do colorful stuff, I overuse the colors. How, how did you settle on that color palette? Is that just something you were, you were drawn to, or was it something that you kind of filtered and, and curated over the years? I just It's just what I was drawn to, basically. Yeah. It's a, my, my favorite colors. I, everything I chose, my, I didn't realize I painted my, one of my, my bedroom when I was single. I painted the teal color. Uh-huh. I said, like, why did you know what made you paint that color? No, I just like the color. You know, one of my cars was that color. It's like, wow, look at this. I'm into this. Mm-hmm. And the nautical, all the nautical pieces have that color, the color palette too. So it's kind of kind of weird how the things yeah, you, repeat. Yeah, you do repeat. have quite a bit of nautical themed pieces uh, that I was able to see. What what is it about the is it just the color palette that appeals to you, or is there something about the that ocean feel, the, the the sea and the mermaids that appeals to you? Well, it's a combination of both. My father would take us to the shore all the mm-hmm. time, pointing out the obscure stuff. Let's go to this cove. Nobody's ever been down there. Let's go to this dangerous place and look at things. Let's go to this... Um, we go down to Georgia down to a military firing range on the beach. Let's go explore this thing. And, you yeah. know, it's like real things you don't think of. And, oh, look, um, in Jersey and Cape May, there's a concrete ship out, out on the shore. Mm-hmm. Oh, we got to go look at the concrete ship. So everywhere I was going we had something nautical involved. And it was just the influence. Um, my father was into shipwrecks and pirates and stuff like that. So that kind of stuff, that ro- the romance of that stuff, the mermaid stories and yeah. stuff, all, that, all the tales of lore came into play but i guess the color palette came from that as well but it's just the you know i like the 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 colors even my waters all you'll never see me paint the basic blue water everything is that teal color and okay. muddy color muddy muddy teal like it's 
And I like, don't like calm waters. You know, they see me with a very serene painting. You'll see it's got to be stormy weather. Right. I like storms. I know there's always some breaks in the waves yeah. and a little bit of, of crests and all that. Exactly. You need some storminess. You need yeah. something happening. It tells the story. Okay, this mermaid's sitting on the shore and there's a storm brewing. But it's in the distance, so the waters are starting to get choppy. Right. Okay, I did a I did a piece, Moby Dick, one of my three dimensional pieces, and I couldn't do a sunny sky. It's got to have the, the the gray sky, the stormy skies, the lightning bolts, and you know some drama. Right. You know this way you have this. You know you tell the story. There's something happening, and the title of the the title of the piece will reflect the the occurrence. The something happening. You know. Sure. So it's always you just don't name it. Like I did a piece called, Mo- it's not Moby Dick, it's Inevitable was the name of the piece. And if you look at the painting, I'll have to explain to somebody, why is it called Inevitable? Why isn't it just Moby Dick? I go, ah, you don't, you look, if you look at this, you go, see this harpoons are getting tossed into Moby Dick? Now, trace the lines of the, mo- um, trace the uh, ropes that are hooked up to the, the, um, the harpoons that are into Moby Dick. So Moby Dick is popping out. And he's going to be going down. So uh, look at the line. You follow the line. The line goes around people's necks, around their arms, around their legs. So when he goes down, everybody's going down. It's right. inevitable that they're going to be right. taking a bath. You know, so <laughs> that kind of stuff. Yeah, and it's a story. Yeah. And you go, oh, wow. And then once they learn the story, the painting goes. Right. You know, they usually sells and stuff. And that, that's that's what you want to do. It's a the story. You know, and that's where the illustrator comes in. You're illustrating Something, but I'm from the other way around. Usually, when you illustrate for a uh, book or a magazine, uh, books, magazines, anything, they tell you what they want. Mm-hmm. Oh, you need a picture of um, such and such is happening in this story or article, whatever you're doing, and you got to illustrate elements of that. So, if uh, the article is about a person falling down the stairs, okay, you got to draw a person falling down the stairs. They'll describe the right. person. So you got to do that so the the bad thing about it is they're in control of the some of the elements on the drawing yeah they pay you well but it's kind of restrictive and stuff but you just do it nonetheless it becomes a chore but now i'm doing it i can take my uh i i'm open for anything i can okay now i'm in control of all the elements and i can let it loose now how do you approach all those different projects i mean if you're working on a painting or a 3d project for yourself or you're working on a, an illustration that you've been commissioned to do, or, or whatever project you're working on, do you have a different approach at the way that you go about doing those different things? Or is, is your approach, your method, generally the same no matter what? Um, let's see. It's kind of difficult to say. I usually wait till the last minute. I, I, I work better under pressure. So if I have a, uh, let's say, an illustration assignment or so, I will, let's say, you know, I don't want to give them sketches or anything. I'll give them a sketch, and, oh, I'm working on this, working on it. Really, I'm not doing a thing on it. Mm-hmm. I just need to get the pressure and the deadline closer so I can make the best elements possible. I, I'm i kind of forced to really work hard on it. Yeah. If I had plenty of time, I'm not going to do anything. I'll just do it. Yeah, here you go, here you go. Right. And it's not fun. It's fun to sit down and do, okay, I got, let's see, it's due tomorrow. I got 12 hours to do it. Ah, let's see if I can do it in six, you know, <laughs> and, and you get it done and it comes yeah. out and it comes out nice. And you usually you turn the music on. And, um, I, if I was doing an illustration assignment, I would turn on industrial music, the old, um, 1980s, the industrial, oh, um, industrial music that you're not really singing along nine inch nails, mm-hmm. Depeche mode, that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Those are the music. That's the music to listen to you to get the, to get the, to the rhythm, so to speak, it's like a machine rolling. Once the machine rolling, doom, 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 you know. Yeah, yeah. And it's just you get the machine going, and then you can have it repeat. Even if I play the same song over and over again, that song is going to give me a rhythm. And I'm not listening to the song; I'm listening to the what's driving the, sure. the drummer, the bass guys, and that's that's leading the picture. But the problem with that is the stuff comes out on the darker side because it's a heavy <laughs> sound. And but that's what it looks like my stuff yeah it, it does look like even if i was painting a uh, field of daisies or something although i'd never get the job to do daisies <laughs> everything i do was everything i had all my assignments are they give you assignments based on your style mm-hmm. so everything i was doing was dr- drama and stuff like that so it worked yeah but if i had to do let's say da- a field of daisies butterflies and daisies i'll oh, forget it you know <laughs> i just would have to turn the music off and 
it would take me a while. I tried the music and I go, I can't do this. So and, do you find there's a, a, a real identifiable, tangible effect of the music you're listening to on the on the work that you're doing? Oh, most definitely. Yeah. Yeah, most definitely. Also, if you had a, um, let's say if you had a fight with somebody, anger. Mm. So emotions and the music all have to do with that. Yeah. The more angry you are, the strong, more powerful the piece. So there's some pieces that like, um, wow, what the hell were you thinking? You go, I don't know. I was kind of mad. I stubbed my toe in the doorway or something, and I was like angry, and I couldn't believe I, you know, my foot hurts, and you know, <laughs> and I couldn't walk, so to speak. So yeah. I was like stuck in the chair, and I needed something to do. Things like that. You don't know yeah, what's going yeah. through, but you can tell a story. I could tell you exactly what I was doing when the piece was made. So now, do you find that there's a any connection between the mood that you're in or the the music you're listening to? And the final piece that you put out there, whether it the, the reception to that piece, is there is there a connection to the way to your environment as you were making it, and the the reception of people who see it? Well, the only thing I actually had to listen to me, this specific move uh, music was when I do I do a lot of Beatles pieces. Okay, wasn't never really fan of the Beatles because I found out they do a, they made a they were genius. They had uh, all the songs are three minutes long. Uh, repetitious catchy tune and stuff they found the success you mm-hmm. know they would you know oh, a quick pop song let's make a song about love and you know and mm-hmm. we'll just use the word love a <laughs> hundred times there you know it's very basic and it was a it was a, it was a genius move mm-hmm. and they were then they they owned the 60s so to speak you know um i did a couple of beatles pieces yellow submarine and stuff like that and i ended up singing it to get in the mood and i had to get the the lightness uh-huh so the parts that I needed the lightness when I was doing the constructing the submarine, a three dimensional element, had to be happy. Yeah. So I was listening to the Beatles music. Um, I did want to do the when I was sculpting the waves. I listened to my own, you know, just a hap, you know, just my haphazard whatever I had, kind of my favorite music and stuff like that. Um, I listened to that to get a different effect. So the the happiness and the 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 deepness or the melancholy of the other pieces. Yeah. It's kind of like an irony. It sets up an ironic thing, so to speak. But, so you're very intentional about the music and the mood that yeah, you're I know, setting I know while you're I, Yeah, I know what I, I know the, um, I did a lot of um, psychological things. I know it's psychologically, I can, you know, you could find out what's wrong with a person yeah. by looking at their art and stuff. Oh, this person's all these jaggy stuff. This person's angry, you know. You right, can see right. an angry person. Oh, this person's all these light colors and stuff like that. Um, yeah, but they're too light. The colors are too light, almost uh, faded away. There's something wrong, and so they lost somebody. So there's that yearning. Right. Yeah, so you, you can see it in everybody's picture. I mean, you can go everywhere. We're sitting in a gallery right now, but you can go every piece, and um, you can go deeply psychologically into everybody's um, psyche, so to speak. Yeah, it seems like you've taken that even a step further. You're manipulating your own psychology. That's, yeah, that's <laughs> a, but being a cartoonist, uh, the cartoonist part is where you... Um, realize that the funnier you are, the more pain there is. Right, right. And I can't be. I'm not. I'm not doing funny things because of that. A lot of cartoonists are um, have a lot of pain, a lot of anxiety. Mm-hmm. Uh, back in the um, let's see, back in the '90s, I met Maurice Sendak. That's one. Of oh my, wow. Maurice Sendak is one of my influences. Yeah. And when I was an illustrator, I was getting hired, and I was running into him, and or and or finding out that I was. Followed by him. I'd start, let's say I'd be working for Bell Atlantic, one of the baby Bells back then. Mm-hmm. And I was the foot in the door for him. So they would try me out for about six months on different projects. And then all of a sudden I find out, okay, we're going to let you go. And I go, well, who do you got coming next? I go, oh, we got Maurice Sendak. <laughs> and this is happening more than one time, huh. like four or five times. I didn't realize that. And it's like, wow, we got some of the, um, the test kitchen for uh, Maurice Sendak. So I finally did meet him. Um, I met him at a, an event I did at the Hudson River Museum in Yonkers, New York. Um, my Again, I was doing the step back in time benefit where I draw my illustrations and drawings and paintings, whatever, were the theme of the uh, show. The mm-hmm. next show was his, where the wild things are. And I sat at the, I got to sit at the table with him and I was, you know, got to talk with him. And I was so wrong. You get so wrong on people, on certain people. And he straightened me out. <laughs> um, it was kind of interesting. Oh, oh, I love the book. Um, I love the book where the wild things are. That was a big influence of me. Uh, yeah. It was dark. Yeah. That, that was my, it was a dark thing. And I go, oh, it was a great book. And he goes, 
And I'm telling him, I like this. You know, what I like about the book? I'm telling him things to go, you didn't read the book. I go, yeah, I read. I got four copies of it, and I read it 100 times. He goes, no, you actually have to sit down and read the book, meaning to examine the book and right, see, the, right. see the pain and see the fact that this guy is a pain in the ass. This kid, Max, is a pain in the ass, and, you know, they really do want to kill him after right. a while. So, right. you know, he's not welcome there in, a, in essence. And he goes back and, he, you know, the one person he scorned, it's where the love came from. Right. And he told me how to look at things. In, it's an uh, amazing story for, was it 11 sentences or something? Yeah, it's, it tells yeah, such it's like, a, it's like, such yeah, an incredible like, story. Also, I think I hear rumor that um, he had a, um, can you make a book with less than 130 words or something in it? Uh, oh, that, 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 that came it into play there. <laughs> <laughs> I got to see if that's the actual book. Yeah, but um, yeah, him, him, Dr. Seuss is another one, uh-huh. another influence. You know, I don't like this um, the mainstream stuff. Oh, he had the. You know, it's kind of cool. The characters, the Grinch is good. The mm-hmm. Lorax, they're good characters and stuff. But he's got some. He's got a dark side. Mm. Um, there's a dark side, and he's got adult stuff, mm-hmm. and it's really, really amazing. My, my favorite Seuss book was. Uh, Bartholomew and his 500 hats, I think it was called. I don't know if anybody else even remembers that one. Wow. <laughs> but if you've seen Theodore Geisel's um, works as a fine artist, oh, my goodness. You got this guy writes children books? Yeah. It just He's got a lot of adult uh, humor, but it's mixing. He likes mixing. That's, I guess, another thing. The way I, I liked him was he mixed things around. He'll have a woman's body and put one of his, let's say, his Seussian heads mm-hmm. on there and totally throw it off. So it's kind of erotic and goofy at the same time. Right. And I thought it was genius. Now, do you ever see the influence of, of people like that in your own work? Do you see the Maurice Sendak's work? I have yours? done I have done that in my, my children's books. I do. Um, I, did, was, I did a children's book um, called, um, oh, it's in my book. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, there's there's no such thing as my I did 26 books. There's no such thing as monsters. This was my own uh, my own creation, uh-huh. and I made it back in the 90s. And the book sold, um, but evidently the what happened was the um, I think it's Gerard Gerard uh, Ferrar and Strauss or something who bought the bought the book. Um, they were taken over by someone else and then they let go of some of the art directors and uh-huh. my book was purchased and it was nice you know but i wanted to, the real joy in that is getting published right you want to see your stuff out there so the book disappeared for like five years and i'm waiting when are we gonna do the book mm-hmm. and oh you got paid don't worry we gave you the down payment but my book was still not published um my book that book had had some um great influence on the um the style of um, Sendak, his right. line drawing, not the wild things, but uh, his earlier stuff, really rosy, um, that kind of look. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, the really intricate lines and yeah, just of that they nature. were intricate. They were not intricate. They were just the line. It was more emphasis on the line work. It was mm-hmm. just it was just a lot happening, but it was just more character based on that. The line was basic, but I just learned to use a the person's uh, sad. You know, use a heavy line. You know, or the angry. Use okay. a heavier line on the person. If they're very happy, just reduce the size of the line. Again, the psychological things come into sure. play when you're just to give it a that's, – that's probably where the patent thing comes from without even knowing. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, you're just changing the feel with a thicker line. Right. A thinner line is lighter and happier than a thicker line. Same thing with a bass, uh, bass note and music is mm-hmm. in a – you know, is different than a light note, you know. So it kind right. of come, – weight comes down to play with a lot of stuff. Um, so – I was able to um, show the uh, manuscript to uh, to Maurice Sendak back then. I just had the manuscript, and I sat, uh, sat there. Nothing ever happened to the book. He liked the book. He goes, wow, this is great. After he told me, he goes, the book started about, he goes, a girl, will, um, a boy will never buy a book about a girl. I had girls in there, and he made mm. me change. He goes, a boy will never buy a book about a girl, but a girl will buy a book about a boy. Huh. And he goes, okay. So he goes, so leave the girls out. He goes, but you did really rosy. He goes, read it. Again, go back and read my stuff. It's not what you think. Huh. That's a little adult. There's something wrong with her. And then you go, realize, you go, all his people are warped. They're not, all his characters and stuff, there's something wrong with right. them. Very flawed. They're, they're yeah. very flawed. And that goes into, he goes, there's a lot of pain in me. He goes, so I choose not to do. Everybody thinks there's whimsy in it. There is, but there's more pain and pathos in it than you think. Right. So it's kind of neat sitting down and talking to this gentleman. And um, 
I learned a lot from that. And I, he's got, I put a quote in there so in my in my book and stuff, you know, so from him, which yeah. stuck to me. And I, I followed that. It's one of those things. And I kept the book black and white. He goes, keep it black. You know, got to stay black and white. Don't go color. And I originally did the book was submitted in color and stuff. Mm-hmm. So um, about three or four years ago, I, re, I was able to get the rights back to my book. Oh, nice. And I go, oh, my book. You know, I go, this is my book and I want it. You know, are you guys ever going to do anything? And they go, oh, we sold off your, you know. We just forgot about it. Yeah, you go ahead with your book, and I got it out, and it was well received. It was nice to have. So it's it out. available now. It is available. It's going to be. Uh, I I pull it out every Halloween. It's it's on it's on it's available at Artfish Forty Two in Milford, um, at Walnut Beach. It's available in. Um, we have a, the gallery in uh, Two Fifty Eight Main Street in Ansonia. Um, it is available on Amazon and stuff like that. There's no such thing as monsters. And it's actually it's a it's a good story, a very simple story, just like a Sindakian thing. You know, it's a right. It, the journey is, you know, um, it's where wild things are. The kid never leaves the bedroom, technically speaking. Right. Uh, but in my book, it's just a traveling. The the little boy, Reggie, uh, Reggie was told not to watch a scary movie, a scary monster movie, but he did. Now he's got to pay the consequences. <laughs> Mom wants him to go to bed, and. This is actually autobiographical. When I was again, you know, we used to watch the movies, and I'd watch the movie from behind the chair, sure. you know, and stuff like that, <laughs> like an idiot. But I was more intrigued and stuff. And now the movie's over. Now I have to go to bed. Right. And what we used to do was turn every light on in the house to get to the bedroom. And if there's a light out there, you would not walk into the dark. Mm-hmm. You can't touch the dark. So you use broomsticks to turn light switches on, reach in the dark. <laughs> it just I don't know what goes through my head, but that's the way you know the imagination would run wild. Sure. And, you know, and it's a story like that. And then before you know it, you know, every light in the house is on. Now, do you feel like like writing a, a book and telling that story is is an extension of the storytelling you do in your visual art as well? They go ha- exactly. They go yeah. hand in hand. They do go hand in hand. A lot of the stuff. They, yeah, again, with the art, you have to have a story. It's not just a picture of. You know, it's not just a picture of. Uh, I'm not just going to paint something because of there. I, you know, I have a couple of a lot of friends and artists and and stuff like this. I'm going to paint a rooster. Yeah. Why? Why are you going to paint a rooster? What's the reason behind that? You know, it's just well, it's just the colors of the rooster I like. And I go, that's not good enough for me. I just yeah. can't do that to do that. I, that's not a. It's not in my repertoire, so to speak. So I need to know what that rooster do to me. <laughs> what is that rooster going to do? Right. What's wrong with the rooster? Yeah. So I'm going to go, oh, there's a rooster, psycho rooster from hell. And it's going to, you know, and then I'll, that's when I'll go outside the frame and I'll go, the rooster's going to come reach out and peck your eyes out kind of thing. Now, even when you were doing that still life on the piece of maisonite, <laughs> <laughs> were you telling yourself a story behind that pineapple at that time? Or is that something that came No, that was, later? I remember, I remember doing, I remember exactly the day of doing it. My father had a gas station. I would sit there, and I don't know why it just came to me. I'm sitting at the desk drawing pictures, and I go, I want to do a still life. Yeah. And I always, like, I always wanted to be a, you know, the artist, the, always, the yearning to be an artist. I want to be an artist. But you, the only thing I can think of, what do artists paint? Oh, they paint bowls of fruit. <laughs> and my mother, it actually led into Mr. Potato Head. Mr. Potato, oh. Mr. Potato Head was my favorite toy back then when you used the real fruit and uh-huh. stuff and the bodies and stuff. Yeah. And my mother used to, she couldn't stand the fact that I was ruining all the fruit and vegetables and stuff. So you use Mr. Potato Head, you're going to ruin a pound of potatoes by the time you finish playing. What, are you going to make holes and everything? Right. And then you're going to eat those right now or who wants to eat those after they've been played with? Um, and we started making... Um, Oh, look, there's a banana in there. Oh, you can make Mr. Banana. <laughs> oh, look, there's a cantaloupe, Mr. Cantaloupe. And you did everything. Yeah. And my mother goes, she uh, she went to, there's a place down in the Bronx called John's Bargain Store. And she went and bought all these plastic fruit. And, well, she actually took the lean on it. Now it's Mr. Potato Head is a plastic fruit. Right. But she was buying the bananas and all the shapes and stuff um, from Mr. Potato Head. So that came into three-dimensional I was putting together the, the Mr. Potato Head at the time and stuff, and the plastic fruits and stuff yeah. that came into play. But I was influenced by that stuff. I was going, should I set them up? I'm going to set them up, and I actually use the same fruit. And I go, let me put them in a bowl and I'll set them up on the kitchen table and paint what I see. Did it look like what I saw? I don't know. I don't. I don't remember. But you know, but to get the bananas sitting just right, I couldn't do it, and I just had to go. I'll. 
wing it and see yeah, what happens. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's so, a, you know. So there is a story behind the still life. There is a story. <laughs> yeah, not not knowing until you mention it. I go, but that's at the time of Mr. Potato it's Head. It's not a bowl of fruit. It's a bowl of potential it's, Mr. Potato it's, Heads. It's, it's a bowl of Mr. Potato uh, Mr. Potato Heads cohorts. Yeah, yeah. You know. And then, you know, that was before Frankie Frankfurter and Willie Burger came out okay. afterwards, and they were the first plastic ones. And all of a sudden, Mr. Potato Head moved to the plastic, and my mother go, oh, thank God, you know, yeah. my fruits and vegetables are safe. <laughs> we had Mr. Applehead, Mr. Orange, uh-huh. Mr. Lemon, you know, and whatever you can stick these bodies, you know, the heads on the bodies and stuff like that, and it's just, uh, you know, you yeah. destroy food. But I was influenced by the, the 3D was always the way to go. Yeah, yeah. So. so what what kind of stuff are you are you working on these days? Are you, are you focused on three D work, or what is it that's that's exciting to you in in your art world? Well, I'd like to. I'm doing right now. I'm currently paying homage to Fisher Price, another childhood toy, mm-hmm. and um, paying homage like taking Fisher Price, which is such an innocent toy. We all played with them and stuff, little people, and applying them to different things. The first picture, the first one I did in that pay homage to them was Moby Dick mm-hmm. Captain Ahab Gregory Peck and are, these, are these the Fisher Price like peg kind of figures they were the actual we're the, about? the yeah. early ones the peg okay. ones so nothing funnier than Gregory Peck you know <laughs> making Gregory Peck I drilled the mouth and he's like reacting you can see he's clearly the body of the Fisher Price yeah. and he's pegged to the whale going down and it's a, it's an angry <laughs> picture and then people go people look at it and go what's wrong with you you know and it got a reaction it's like wow that's great yeah so unlike my other Moby Dicks, my other Moby Dick people, uh, pay, uh, paintings and stuff, did several of those. This is taking it to the next level. This is like, oh, I'm going to have fun with this. Yeah. And I just, just applying. Because what influenced me on the views in the Fisher Price was I was, walking, I was walking one day to work. And somebody's throwing out the Fisher Price house and a box of little people. Mm. And I, why are you throwing these out? This is great. These are toys. Yeah. You know? And I just... I don't know why it took them. What was I going to do with these? And they just sat there. And then I go, hmm, maybe I can do something with these with art. Yeah. And I go, and I just sat on it. And then, you know, when I did that inevitable piece that I spoke about, I that's when the, the one to follow that was the Fisher Price Moby Dick. Okay. And then I uh, did that, and I did two of those. It sold in like two minutes. That one. Wow. I was like, wow, it was really fast. Went, are you using the actual figures? I started out using the actual figures. Now the pieces are like fifteen dollars each on eBay and oh, stuff wow. like that. And I go, oh, that's gonna be ridiculous. Yeah, so and now they're molded from the pieces now or something. Uh, now I do is I I made molds of them, yeah. and so I can make molds and I can actually change them around now, and I and I can make as many as I need like I just recently did a piece called The Last Supper uh-huh. and I did The Last Supper Jesus and Company all sitting at the table according to Fisher <laughs> Price so you got it and everybody sit there and then I was mulling that for about a year and a half I never I didn't do the piece thinking that people would be offended so you had that it. image burned into your oh, mind oh it was in my head it was in there and it was I just made it I made the piece in like three hours four hours max wow and the only thing that keeps you from doing it um, going faster is you have to let the paint dry right and the clay's got to dry, you know. I use the terracotta clay, and the, so that's got to sit in the oven for several hours, baking sure. for like four hours, five hours. So everything got to sit and bake. Um, and that's otherwise would be a really quick process. But you just sit there, and then life gets in the way. I'm gonna go watch a TV show, eat dinner, whatever. You know that gets in the way. And if I could sit down and do it from beginning to end, it, it, I figured about a four-hour piece. Yeah. You know, and it just um, it flows, but. Um, yeah, I just make the molds, and I found out I don't have to make the whole figure. I just have to cut the back off so they can mount them on all the paint or all the pieces are on wood, mm. so I won't have to cut the back off to mount them. No more, sh- no more screws. I just use the goop, the shoe goop mm-hmm. stuff, which is a really great glue. Um, so I just really glue them on. You know, everybody's glued on, and I fit them into the scene. And if there's any elements like the yellow submarine, I did a Captain Nemo piece that was in Connecticut Magazine or at the holidays. Oh, wow. um, and that, that one I used a real piece on, but I had to sit him inside the submarine, Captain ne- the, Nautilus the Nautilus inside. Yeah. He had to sit inside there, and it was such a pain in the neck, you know, <laughs> pain in the neck to get him in there in the seat because you got to make the now I got to to fit this guy in there. I have to either cut him in half or make the submarine deeper. Right. Then it doesn't look like it's in. It's more jumping out at you. It's more sticking out. You know, sticking out more than I want it to stick out. Yeah. So I learned to cut things in half and. Molding the pieces saves me a lot of space, and I could also make instead of waiting to find uh, Billy the Angry, um, 
the angry little boy or something for a piece, or let's say Casey Jones, mm. um, they have an engineer, a um, little engineer for Fisher Price. Instead of finding the engineer, I can make my own engineer. So right. I'm going to do Casey Jones. I got that one's in the works too. The Grateful Dead, Casey um, Jones. Actually, not the great. <laughs> actually, the Grateful Dead took. They did. Um, Grateful Dead. It's a great song, but they took the. Uh, well, he made that made Casey Jones popular too again. But the actual real story for Casey Jones was he was he was on um, he was actually on opium speed, uh-huh. and he was um, you know they had to get a train a certain place, and he was he was on the uh, opium back then. A lot of Chinese worked on the uh, railroads back then. And opium mm-hmm. was a thing the the speed made you it was like your caffeine fix. Mm-hmm. So what he did was he had to get to I, I forgot where we had to go. I don't know if he had to go to Chicago or something. But he had to get there in a certain amount of time. Casey took the shift. He goes, I can get there. I can get the train there. No problem. All right, great. Because back then they didn't have any time schedules. Like, you know, if a train left at noon from New York and the train left at, you know, it's going to arrive at noon in Chicago. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, it's going to drive at a certain time. But they didn't have any time schedules. So the trains were messed up. Right. So what happened was he they pulled all the um, trains out of the way for him, except there was one train that had four cars on too much and it was an area where they had these sidings uh, where the tracks switch away mm-hmm. and this train had um two cars on casey jones my uh, main line and he was coming through and he was flying and um they put out these things called torpedoes on the track and they lay him on the track and they put him a mile away so he and what they do is when the train runs over him you know there's danger ahead and they would explode and set off a bang. And you would say, hey, what was that bang? You know, oh, they're putting torpedoes on the track. That means stop. Right. And they put six of them on the track. He didn't stop in any of them. And <laughs> he hit the tail end of the train and knocked his train into another train on another siding. So the crash had three or four trains in the, in, in the, in the, uh, in the, um, you know, in the actual dam, you know, in the actual report, there were right. actually three or four trains involved. But his train, everybody's waiting on the side for him to cut through, and he just hit him so hard. But the key thing, the only person to die in the in the thing was Casey Jones. The only one. The only one to die in the mishap. Wow. And he did save everybody. He made everybody get to the back of the train. So that's why he's considered a, a so <laughs> hero. Set, set up his own heroic stunt. Yeah, he set up his own his yeah. heroic stunt in a way. But that's you know he was a hero for saving everybody, and he moved everybody to the back of the train, right. um, and told the um, switch uh, the 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 fire guy who works with him. They have a engineer and a fire guy who runs the fire. He made him jump off the train. Oh, okay. So. Now you're telling this story in one and of I'm your pieces, and I'm saying it in the, it's in the story. So okay. it'll have it'll have the pieces. Uh, Casey Jones. It's being. I'm currently working a Pringles can into the locomotive. The locomotive's ah. coming out, and he actually hit the caboose of the other train. So he's going to be ramming through the caboose. In the Grateful Dead song, he hits a switch, um, some other train coming head on mm-hmm. or something. You know, you know, track, you know, whatever it's, the tra- you know, switch man sleeping train 102 yeah. is on the wrong track and <laughs> headed for, for you. you right? No, he's heading, he was heading for the back end of the train. It was on the tracks. I guess it's not as exciting as the Grateful Dead song, <laughs> you know, but it was, it's just, it's going to be funny the way it is. Yeah. It's going to light up. I'm going to try to make it light up with LEDs and stuff like that. Leave oh, that. Neat. Okay. So it'll have the lights on it, but I'm trying to, like the baseball bat in my, um, We Were Legends piece, um, that's going to have uh, the locomotive's got to come out a certain way. Okay. And the hardest part's going to be making the wheels. I'm not just taking, oh, just take a Lionel train and put it in. No, no, no. i got to make the locomotive my yeah, style. Yeah, yeah. And the caboose is going to be made of balsa wood or something and painted. And well, it's going to be it's gonna be exploding right. on impact. So it's going to be a lot I of shards. I can't wait to see that. That's going to be interesting. So that one's in the works. So where can people see your work? Um, the Fisher Price stuff is on is on display regularly in uh, Artfish Forty Two, which is on uh, Forty Four Norgatuck Avenue in Milford, okay. down at the Walnut Beach area. And I got about six or seven pieces there. Um, the Last Supper is going in there. Um, I have um, the Yellow Submarine. Um, Yellow Submarine Two is in there, which is um, that piece is called uh, a thing of beauty. Destroy it forever. <laughs> which is what the mean what the meanie what the meanie yelled when he's flying on the the right. flying glove. Yeah. So I got the, it's the meanie flying above the yellow submarine. It was an actual scene in the movie. Mm-hmm. Perhaps not. I just <laughs> I just took it and combined the two with the quote and I used the quote as 
Yeah, they get people to think about the piece. Oh, why is it just called Yellow Submarine? Because that'd be too easy. Right. You know, let them think. Let them watch the movie. Find out where the um, where a thing of beauty destroy right. it forever right. came from. And you know, why is it called? But look at it. And you go, oh, now I can see how it's done. So even the fish are leaping out of the. You know, the meanies coming in. I have the fish leaping out of the photos on either side and the submarine surfers and all the beetles just looking up at it kind of thing. And they're Fisher Price. <laughs> Captain uh, Nemo's there. Okay. Um, the last sub, your last sub, I said it'll be there. Um, what else I got there? Oh, I got um, Profiles in Courage, which is um, a lighthouse scene with um, Ernest Hemingway. Oh, <laughs> that's, okay. that's great. I'm surprised you didn't sell it. So the lighthouse <laughs> turns on. For six hours every day and turns off. I have a, I put a, um, a timer in there. It's got a time light. Okay. Um, the whoever buys it can change the batteries in the back, and it, the batteries last for six months, and it goes on and off every day, and just lights up. And Ernest Hemingway is battling a, a, a kraken coming out of the water, a giant squid. And it's grabbing him and grabbing the lighthouse, ripping the lighthouse apart, and he's tied himself with rope to the. Uh, to the lighthouse and he's just being defined his hair is, his white hair is blowing in the wind he's just sitting there waiting to you know challenge the uh <laughs> the kraken yeah. whatever that is yeah so but it's fun it's it's a story you know it's like that one's a little difficult because that was a remake of a the, uh, the original concept that was called originally called trouble at tappy town late it just didn't work had okay. the wrong title and like, i envision it's some drama and some story but it just I had to put the figures in there All right. and stuff to tell the story. I had to tell the story again. Then it works. And then I had seagull. I put seagulls and his um, seagull poop all over the top of the lighthouse. <laughs> I mean, the little, there's little pieces that you have to look at everything. Yeah. You know, because it's got to tell the story. What's the bird doing up there? Oh, I see the bird's, you know, the bird is uh, just sitting there while it's coming down. But he's pooping all over yeah, the place. Right. And it's dripping down the side. It's kind of gross. But just it's subtle. It's not. Right. You just got to pick out the little things. And it makes the piece entertaining. Oh, look, I see this over there. Oh, I see that over there. You know, yeah. instead of, oh, look, it's the shore. Oh, what is that? It's the shore. It's the waves coming in. What about it? I don't know. It's just waves. <laughs> this is something happening. So there's, you know, a lot happening. And that's the whole idea. Tell the story. Yeah. Make it exciting. Make them, you're, you're catching a, like a photograph, you're catching a glimpse of time. But whose time is it? Who knows? It's just, just make them think. The yeah. whole idea is to make the artist, to make the viewer think. Sure. You know, and so, so they can see the stuff in at the 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 gallery in Milford. That's at Milford. And uh, what about like online? If people want to just take a look at your stuff, um, you can. Well, right now you can see my stuff on Facebook. Okay. Um, the studio of Richard DiCarlo, uh, Facebook. Um, you know, um, that's probably the best way to see it because the stuff doesn't hang. Unfortunately, the stuff doesn't. It goes so fast. Well, that's so, fortunate, right? Which is a good. Which is a good. <laughs> but the problem is, you fall kind of. Well, I don't. I don't fall in love with the piece, but I do like to hang around with my stuff for a little while. Right. You know, and it's it's sad seeing it go, but it's like it's got a good home. It's, yeah. it's fun. But you, once you get the the gist of things and get the machine going, it's nice to pay the bills. Yeah, I'll bet. But but it's a good it's a good problem. Right now, I have in the works uh, large pieces. By it's a five foot. Well, I don't know where it's going to be, but it's um, the start off with a frame. I was given this nice gilded frame, about a five by four frame, five feet by four foot frame, mm -hmm. and um, that's gonna be a King Kong. Oh, excuse me, that's gonna oh, be a King Kong. King Kong it's just gonna huh? be called Kong. It's the 1920s King Kong, Empire State Building. I started doing the that I made a sketch on because I didn't know what to. Well, that's I'm, a big uh, image. Probably wouldn't fit in in, <laughs> in the head. In your yeah, head no, all it don't fit itself, in my right? head. I know. I know what I want to do in, with King Kong and stuff, but I don't know what the top of the Empire State Building looked like oh, right. back in the twenties. So I had that, to use yeah. reference and the biplanes because I can do it out of my head, and I'll have a generic building, or I'll have the biplanes won't look like a certain right, thing. Right. I want to keep everything almost historic. And Fay Ray is going to be in the gorilla's hand, in the gorilla's hand, the gorilla's hand, Kong's hand. He's mm -hmm. going to be on the building, and he'll be holding on one hand, and being the airplane's going to be buzzing. They're going to be three-dimensional um, airplanes. I was looking for airplanes and stuff, but I'm going to have to build my own. So I'll build my own biplanes um, to go at the time. They're going to have Fisher Price people in them as pilots. Uh, Faye Ray is another Fisher Price person, but she's actually going to be the first time I'm actually being a larger one because I want to oh, force okay. perspective. The hand is going to come out of the, the hand is the fist is coming out and holding her out. Right. So the planes will be going around him. I don't know if I'm going to make the propellers move and stuff like that. And um, I do have a um, 
device, a mechanism I can make either the hand move or maybe his face move when you reacts to sound. So you may snap your finger and he'll change his expression oh, or maybe wow. open his mouth. You know. Some animatronics and everything. Yeah, in just there, something huh? fun. You can you know, little gimmicky things. Yeah, you know, I yeah. buy I buy I go around and buy things. I don't know why I buy them because I got these little sharks and you push the button and the shark grabs it. It was a candy thing I saw. <laughs> and I bought like three or four. Why'd you buy those? It's so stupid. I go I bought them for the mechanism. It's so can't be, but I can use it for something. Right. So maybe a painting will have. I am I'm going to do a Jaws piece, ah. and that piece is going to be called. You're going to need a bigger. We're going to need a bigger boat. <laughs> and I'm thinking of if I can not use the sharks I, I've used, but if I can replicate the mechanism on a larger scale. Push mm. the button. The giant shark comes up and he pops out of nowhere and takes a bite wow. out of the boat. You know. Yeah, so, so you got some exciting stuff to work on then. Huh? It's it. It's yeah. they're there. They're all in. They're all in the row. I have a couple of Bible pieces coming. I got Noah in the Noah's Ark, and I got the Ten Commandments because I didn't realize the um, Last Supper was going to get that much of uh, it'd be uh, that, that popular. I'm like, oh yeah. boy, I got a whole niche here. Let me let me go. <laughs> let me explore that. But there are certain things you want to leave out of religion. So I don't want to let's say do the. I don't know if any, those are familiar with Catholic school that's in church, the stations of the cross or something. Right. That's Those are done as a relief, three-dimensional and stuff like that. But I just can't envision myself doing Fisher Price with that. <laughs> although it's been, if somebody wants to pay me for it and I can, you know, I'm going to hell, but, you know, you get a sellout for the devil or so, whatever, so be it. But, I mean, I think it, it'll be kind of funny, but yeah. if somebody wants to commission me for it, I will do that. But it just it's one of those things that's kind of eh, it's borderline or, tasteless. Let you know. the image burn in your mind for a year and a half. You'll probably do yeah, it no, anyway. Yeah, I'll, I'll probably, I'll probably do it. <laughs> I think it'll be funny as hell, <laughs> but again, I just don't want to offend any. You know, I right. try not to offend anybody. I, I'm really, I try to walk that fine line. It really doesn't come down to offending anybody, but I don't want the negativity and stuff. Right. Like if I'm showing in a gallery, I don't want to, you know, somebody coming in there and attacking the gallery person or something for doing that. Oh sure. You're like you know, they have the guys putting, um, you know, the crosses in urine and stuff. I mean, that's that's over the line, mm. and even my stuff that's so clean candy. Uh, candy coated. I don't want to go there. I just yeah. don't want to don't want to do that. But it's it's there and it's possible that I may one day just go. Why not? Yeah, right. you know, you get that little why not and what if? Yeah, and that's what comes. Out. That's a playfulness comes in and the and but that's the whole idea behind art. A successful piece of, piece of art is getting a reaction, good or bad. It's a reaction. Right. They always say the old adage: art is what you uh, art isn't what you see; it's what you make people see. You know, I forgot who said that, but it's a it's a great quote, and yeah. I just go by that. And it's you know one of those monikers you just see it my way. That's all. And important things like title, or just as more just as important as the imagery and stuff. If you yeah. don't have a I tell artists that come into the gallery, I go. It just to me it shows you not you don't care. You know you don't care enough to name it. Mm -hmm. Give a name. Give it a story. What can I tell the people when they're coming and looking at you? Oh look, it's a boat. What about the boat? It's a painting of a boat. It's a lovely painting of a boat. They want to know, where is it? What's it doing? Whose boat is it? Is that your boat? No, it was just a boat. Where was this? Were we on vacation? I don't know. Hmm. Yeah, I just lifted the photo off the, uh, you know, I got the photo off on, you know, off the internet. Yeah. Yeah, you know, there's no story. Right. Yeah, you know, I want to know a lot about it. Where, who, what, where, when, you know, and why. Why'd you paint it? You yeah. know, what is the influence? Yeah, I, I was think that, Story is a, a vital element in ev every piece of art, no matter what the, f the exactly. format is. Painting or writing, anything. Performing. Yeah. If like a, well, the, the, uh, the images I do are kind of like a still life of performance. Right. You know, a, something, a piece of a, a performance, so to speak. So if you were, you know, if you're able to make it move, what have something happened before, something happened after, and this is the during. You know, it's like watching a dance recital or, right. uh, or a play and stuff. If you just watch somebody get on stage and stand there, it's not interesting. Right. If you're acting, it's interesting. Right. You know, I want dialogue. I want action. I want something, you know. But even then, the best dialogue, if you're good at your word, you know, I'm a fan of the um, the monologists. Mm. You know, I like watching monologues and stuff because you can see person make you think, you know, in that sense. Like yeah. I'm doing visually, they're doing painting with right. words, trying to make you think. So I'm there visualizing the story. 
you know, Spalding Gray comes away, Garrison Keller. You know, these guys, they, they make you think. Yeah, yeah. You know, and it was just fascinating. Anyway, oh, boy, this story. And it doesn't influence. I, won't, I can't take their their art and turn it into anything. I will never, I don't want to do that, but I would take uh, the concept, the idea, the total thing as a whole, then use it. You know, sure. Oh, boy, I like the way they illustrated the picture he did, you know, so I can use that in my in my work. But the whole idea is to have fun with it and, you know, to and to get a reaction. Yeah. And it's fun to do that. And I also got a Godzilla piece in the works. Too. Oh, jeez. It's not going to be as, which ironically is a movie coming out, but I had Godzilla in my head for... Uh, maybe 10 years. Well, yeah, I mean, um, there's a Kong musical on Broadway. Oh, I didn't know that. There's a new Godzilla movie <laughs> that just came out. So you're hitting all the monsters at the same time that the uh, I that never, re- I didn't realize. I, I just found out there was a Godzilla <laughs> one coming out. Because what happened was I was looking for, I'm an end scale. I do model railroading, which is another oh, kind of wow, influence. Okay. And I like end scale, the smaller stuff. You can make landscapes and stuff. Mm-hmm. And on my layout, I have in my attic as uh you step on a board, and I have the Loch Ness monster come out of a lake in the uh, back. It's just a matter of just a um, uh, lever. Yeah. You step on them, however fast you lever, and the monster comes out in the background. Otherwise, it's a normal setup. Right. Oh, it's uh, you know, it's uh, the town of Maxwell <laughs> and Alexander. Oh, you know, Alexander named after my two kids. There's two towns on the layout. Oh, okay. Named after the kids, and nothing happening except for the one little image in the back. If you want something <laughs> to happen, look in the back. Look at the lake. Watch this. <laughs> comes up. You know, a little a drama little story there too. A little story there, <laughs> but I mean that's uh, I Godzilla came out of that. I had these train cars. There's a famous picture of Godzilla eating the train cars, mm-hmm. and end scale would be perfect. The only problem was the train cars like thirty dollars each, and I go, oh boy, I don't want to. There were my setup is kind of these train cars are actually too long to use on my layout, but they they were expensive, and I just leave them sitting there mm-hmm. on the on the tracks on the <laughs> side. Um, they can't, you know, they're too big. They don't, they make the turns, but they look unnatural. And that bothers me. Yeah. Something that's not natural bothers me. That's the artist coming in, coming in to play. It's like having a white canvas with a dot on it. If there's oh, yeah. a dot on it, I get rid of the dot or I can't use that. Right. <laughs> um, but I had the cars, the cars are there. And then somebody gave me cars and I inherited a bunch of free train cars. And I go, wow, they cost me nothing. So those I can cut up. <laughs> so I'm going to put him in Godzilla's mouth. His tail, the his tail is the fins on his back are going to light up with LEDs and stuff like oh, that. Wow. You'll, you'll have to push a button for that. If I can make him sound activated, it's even better. Wow. Like snap your fingers and th- there is a toy that has the um, the roar, yeah. whatever the thing is. And if I can put that in there too, put I'm some, do put that. Some of that electric breath of his, exactly. In there too, electric, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and he's of course going to be have next to the 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 power lines and stuff like that. But that would be a simpler one. It's not going to be as big as King Kong, but, you know. And in the foreground, the Fisher Price element is going to be, I'm going to make a bunch of Japanese, um, let's say, little Japanese tour, you know, kind of tourist guys running away from King Kong, uh, Godzilla mm-hmm. in the foreground kind of thing. So you'll all see right. the, all the Fisher Price people running away from Godzilla in the background. I'm going to have to make sure to... to follow up on your Facebook page and, and see all these things as, as you're creating them. Yeah, so 2019 is going to be interesting. Next yeah. one, uh, the one that's actually being touched right now is um, called Venus on a Half Shell. It's Botticelli's Birth okay. of Venus, but she's Fisher-Price. So i got to <laughs> alternate her. I was going to use the mother, alter the mother character for Fisher-Price, mm-hmm. but I have to do elongated because um, Venus is Venus. It's, mm-hmm. the, you can't just use somebody... To um, you, know, you just can't. You got to do something to the character. Right, so that's right. very character driven. So I, was, I went to AC Moore's. I found a nice seashell. I'm going to cut that in half and use the real shell. It's going to have the water elements like the yellow submarine. The water's coming out of it, and um, it's going to be a fun piece. Yeah, it'll be fun, simple and fun. So that sounds great. I'm going to knock those out. So well, thank you so much for uh, for well, sitting you. down and talking to me. It's been really enjoyable. Thank you. Now you see a really warped art community, <laughs> but I'm not as warped as others. But it's fun. Oh, everybody's got their thing. Thank, <laughs> thank you, you again. Thank you. One more round of thanks to Richard for coming on the podcast. I always appreciate the candid stories that guests are willing to share. Now, if you want to see Richard's work, make sure to visit the studio of Richard DiCarlo on Facebook. Last name is spelled D-I-C-A-R-L-O. 
and you can scroll through all of his pieces on there. Uh, it's kind of a little bit cartoon, a little bit sculpture, and really a whole lot of character in each piece. They almost seem, to me anyway, like living illustrations. So don't forget to leave your rating or review of Table to Stage on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. Those things do legitimately help to grow the audience, and they make the host feel all warm and fuzzy inside. And who doesn't like warm fuzzies? Unless they're tribbles. I hear those things are terrible. Okay, that's it for now. Until next time, keep creating. (laughs) 